Hello there. This is Jay Frost speaking to you from, of course, the Philanthropy Mastermind series. So happy that you are joining us today. This is going to be a lot of fun. A conversation with someone I really do admire because she has gone out on a limb to teach us things that most people have been somewhat reluctant to do, probably because they're often besieged by those of us in this field. Uh, so I'm going to introduce her to you in a minute. But right now, I just want to say hello, welcome you here, maybe for the first time, maybe you're coming back. Um, encourage you to say hello in the chat. I think that would be great for our guest today, but also for all of you. So you'll know who's here and you can maybe say which part of the country or the world you're from, maybe which organization you're with, if you'd like to do that. But please do use the chat as a way to, to, uh, to welcome others uh, here into the conversation. And we'll be monitoring that as well as the Q&A throughout so you can be a part of the conversation since we can't see or hear you. And you can do all that once again in the chat or the Q&A. And I do want to welcome Jen and Edwin uh, and Nina and Matt, uh, who are already going ahead and saying those things right here at Hello, Heather. It's great to see all of you. Uh, and please do keep that space warm. Hi, Celia. Um, and, uh, and, and continue using the chat throughout. We're really going to be paying attention to that carefully today. I also want to thank our sponsor of this series, which is Donor Search. And unless our guest chooses to mention them for some reason, we won't be talking about them today. So don't go away. You can learn plenty about them over at their website at donorsearch.net, where you can learn also about your donors, which is really the focus of our conversation today. But while you're there, I hope you'll take a look at the resources tab where there you'll find recordings of hundreds of these sessions we've done. We go back to 2016 with a series and we are doing on the order of about 100 uh, this year alone. And a lot of that content is available for you once again at donorsearch.net under the resources tab or on their YouTube channel and maybe wherever you like to listen for our podcast. Um, now, with that, I do want to say hello to, of course, Lisa Greer. It's going to come on screen in a minute. Uh, Lisa is, of course, the author of Not Only Philanthropy Revolution, which I hope you have in your shelf and is in a box right now as we finish our podcast studio, but also this book. And if you can't read it, I'm going to tell you what it is. That, of course, is the Essential Fundraisers Handbook, and it is essential. If you're a fundraiser, I hope you get this. Um, we're going to be talking a lot about it today. Uh, and with that, thank you so much, Lisa, for spending some time together. Thank you for having me. As always, it's always wonderful to talk to Mr. Jay Frost. So, yeah. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. It's very kind of you. Uh, it's always great to talk with you. And I know you're kind of making the rounds, but um, often it's, you know, again, kind of sharing often from a stage. So this is really a chance to talk about some of the things that you've experienced and that are informing, well, I guess, both books. Um, but this is great because in a sense, um, it, it takes off where your last book left off and helps us to put into practice through a lot of top tips as well, which is another fun feature of this book. Some of the things that we haven't done very well in this space, and you've been on the receiving end of some of that bad practice for a long time. Yeah, but um, receiving receiving end of on some good practices too. So I'm uh, the nice news is that uh, I've been doing this now for several years, and I am seeing a change, and um, it's it's exciting. Uh, people will call me and say, "Well, I read your book, so even though I'm really asking you for money, I'm not really going to ask you this way." And <laughs> it's, it's great. So I'm glad they're paying attention. It's fantastic. Hopefully, we're making some change. Uh, yeah, there's there's always room for change, and that's that's kind of embedded in the book too. Um, but before we get into that, maybe it would be helpful for people who don't know you or your work to know a little bit about how all this got started. Do you mind giving kind of a thumbnail sketch about where this began for you? Sure, I'll do the the kind of quick and dirty as quick and dirty as I can. Um, and so, my husband Josh and I um, live in Los Angeles. He's from Toronto. I'm from LA. And we both grew up in middle class households where the word philanthropy was not used or the word philanthropist. If you said that, that usually meant somebody who was really a not very nice person who kind of pushed their weight around and wasn't great. So we just didn't we didn't not use it. We just it just wasn't part of our our, our world. Um, the extent of our giving was usually things like Girl Scouts, uh, um, PTA, uh, school things. Uh, uh, synagogue things, that kind of stuff. So, uh, and that was, and that was fine. And then uh, we had this day after uh, we're both serial entrepreneurs, um, both spent some time in the corporate world with the entertainment industry. 
And uh, there was this day about, it's now probably 12 years ago, and where we found ourselves in a position where we were about to become incredibly wealthy. And we were really, really nervous about it. Um, not, not in the just excited nervous, but also in the, we don't want to become one of those people that we imagine philanthropists to be. And we didn't even know if we wanted to use that word. And did we want to tell anybody? And some of our kids were like, if this happens, we want to give it all away immediately and things like that. And so we decided to make ourselves um, uh, less nervous when it was about 10 days before the IPO. Uh, and we knew there was, I, I, maybe there's a 50-50 chance of it happening or not at that point. So we decided to sit down and, uh, and he was going to be gone for 10 days. And this is the last time I was going to see him before our life changed. Uh, so we, I said, why don't we both come up with, assuming this happens, we'll have whatever money we need. Why don't we think about where we want our first uh, donations to be? I didn't say gifts because I didn't know that was a word that was used. I just said donations. So uh, he said, fine, if that's what you want to do, great. And I said, yeah, I think it'll help us to really kind of start focusing a little bit. And it's a fun exercise to do. And it'll, it, it also, maybe there's some research involved and I can get distracted. So I won't think about this, this change. And so uh, he, I, I asked him what he wanted to do. I said, there's enough money that if this happens that uh, we can each choose something. So I said, what would you like to choose? And he, I said, anything you wanna do. And he said, well, and uh, Josh has had Crohn's disease since he's been about 11 or 12 years old. He'd had multiple surgeries, really impacted his life. And he said, uh, I would like to find out where the best research is being done in the country to combat um, Crohn's disease and possibly find a cure and possibly even find out why people get it so they don't have to go through what I went through. So I said, great, I will uh, do some research in that while you're away because I've never talked to people who do those kinds of things, so I'll find out. And uh, he said, great, you know, go do that. I said, okay, great. Uh, and it was a Sunday, so I couldn't really do anything about it right then. I could look online, but, but I, I then said, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I'm the incoming chair of our uh, synagogue and we have a capital campaign going on, which I only knew was called a capital campaign because we had someone from CCS who had consulted and told us it was called a capital campaign. Uh, and we were restoring our sanctuary and we needed another million dollars to uh, end the project, to complete the project. And so I said, why don't I start in on my tenure as having given the final million dollars to get this done? And uh, I also like checking off things off my list. So I figured I can check that off my list that I don't have to come in worrying about that. So he said, okay, fine. If that's what you want to do, you know, that's fine. You've got my support. And I said, well, the really cool thing about this, assuming, okay, now we've got these two things figured out, but the good news is one of the good news things is that I can now call them and tell them that I'm going to do this, assuming this thing comes through. And I'm not going to say this wasn't also a little bit of a deal with God that gosh, it should only happen. And if we do good things up front. So we were, we were doing a little of that. And, uh, and he said, great, let's do it. So I make a phone call to the head of the uh, the synagogue and who was a dear friend and knew all about this IPO about to happen. And uh, I said, I just want to let you know, we're sitting in the living room, we're talking and we, uh, we've decided that we want to give you, assuming this happens in 10 days, we want to give you the final million dollars for the, uh, to close the capital campaign, which is exactly what I saw and what, what I said. And I, I didn't know what response I was going to get, but of course, as a lay person or somebody who's never been part of this, I figured she might have a little shriek. She might say, thank you so much. She might, I don't know. Um, I also kept thinking of the publisher's clearing house, you know, and the balloons right. and the whole thing going on, right? <laughs> and so I, I was like, okay, I don't know what's going to happen, but I, I just got to get those words out of my mouth. So I did. And I said, we'll give you the final million dollars. And she said, um, nothing. And I didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I said, did you hear what I said? Are you still there? And she said, yes. And I said, well, did you hear what I said? And she said, yes. Uh, and I said, well, did you want to say anything? And she says, I don't know if I, oh, she says, I don't know what to say. And I said, you can just say thank you. And thinking that was normal. And she said, I don't know if I can because I didn't make an ask. And that was when I really thought my life had gone into, I, I, I you know, kind of lifted the edge on, on this new world that was really weird because what world is there where people don't just say thank you? And, um, but then it got worse because we both hung up the phone. She did not say thank you. We both hung up the phone and I was like, I can't believe this just happened. And the phone rang again and she said, can you, and I thought she's calling back because she's real, she was just stunned and she wants to say, you know, thank you, but she didn't. She said, can I talk to your husband? And I gave the phone to my husband and she said, do you have any idea what your wife is doing? And 
neither of us could believe it. And we really were just stunned. And we, and, and, and I thought, I, 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 I don't know if I did something wrong. Like how, what is this place where people don't say thank you? And so I, um, we did give the money. Uh, we gave the money to both places. The second place we gave to was uh, a major hospital where my husband had had most of his surgeries. And it took seven months for them to accept $2 million from us, which was uh, for, to endow a chair, which at that point we didn't know what that was, but, but it took seven months because they kept um, basically ignoring us. So we got to call various people and because we weren't on that list of previous donors, they, we, weren't, we didn't exist and, and we, they didn't have time for us. So we had the first meeting and the guy put uh, three different things in front of me. Um, it was in person. It was kind of a, one of the more junior fundraisers there because of course they didn't know who the heck we were. Um, and by the way, the information on the IPO was all public information and they could have looked it up easily, but they didn't bother. Uh, so, and, and a word to your, your listeners, you should always look it up because a lot of this stuff is public. And uh, anyway, so we sat down and he said, okay, here's three different things at three different price categories. Which one are you interested in? And all different ways we could support this mission. And I looked at them and I said, both of us did. And we said, oh, I, any of them are fine. And I knew what he was doing. I've been a salesperson in the past. And I thought he's just trying to see if we flinch at one of the numbers. But I said, no, any of them are fine. Tell us which one you need most. And he got really confused and he left. And we didn't hear from him for a month. And I started calling and calling. And I'm like, hello, we'd like to give you money. And this went on back and forth for about seven months until they finally uh, agreed to accept our money. And, uh, and then everything was sort of okay after that, but it was very strange. So I then spent some time trying to figure out if that was just me and I found out it wasn't. And I found out that these stories are all over the place. Uh, and I thought, well, what if, if the big donors, I'm looking at the age of most of the donors of the big institutions, and a lot of them are in their 80s and they're small groups of people. Usually I call them the 10 older white men. And, and they're funding, it was like the same group of people were funding every different group I could think of uh, in general, more or less. And I thought, well, they're in their 80s. What happens when they go? And if they're treating new people who walk in like this, then we've got a huge problem here. Like lots and lots of nonprofits will just go out of business and they won't know what, what happened. So I decided to dedicate my life to this and trying to make a change and let people know what donors heard and what they thought and and not it's not to bitch about it it's because I I then I started writing a little bit about like why is this happening and I got a call from the Chronicle of Philanthropy and they said we want to know who you are and why you're writing this and I said well and I kind of told them what I just told you and um and then they I, I said, but I'm confused. What are your other donors that you talk to say? And they said, we don't have any. And I said, what do you mean? They said, donors don't talk. We don't have any donors. I said, so you're writing about how people should approach donors, but you never talk to donors? And they said, yeah. And so I really thought, well, I guess, I guess I've now figured this out and someone has to do something. So it might as well be me. So that's what I do. There are so many questions in bed now, <laughs> but, but you know what? I don't usually do this this early, but I'd love to know if, if, if folks who are with us live have any kind of reaction to this, just a visceral reaction to what you just heard. I would love to know what that is. Um, <laughs> well, one is laughter. So, yes. and all the reactions are valid, but yeah, so shocking. That's more of mine, but yeah, I guess it is funny in a terrible sort of way. Surprised, obviously. Thank you, Jake. Um, I mean, it is shocking because even though you say it's very prevalent and I believe you, it's shocking to hear both those stories, including the timeline. And then we have one person who says, I've experienced this too. So I, and another who says, I've experienced the same thing. And why make it so difficult to accept a gift? Hannah's comment, which I completely agree with. Uh, I know that sometimes there's a due diligence issue, right? So if, if, for example, someone calls up, this happens now with some frequency, that uh, there'll be some note or an email or phone call. And the person says they'd like to make a big gift. And there was one institution uh, recently that that it has been in a lot of trouble because they accepted something without doing the research. But as you just said, that's not true with you. The IPO was out there. It was public. They could look at it. So now having gone through this experience, I'm curious about a whole bunch of things. But one is, what is your relationship with those institutions like today? Did they learn from this? Ooh, good question. Actually, no one's ever asked me that. Usually they ask me, did you still give the gift, which I saw one of your listeners wrote. We did still give both gifts. Um, and the it was, it was um, I, I think that 
well, the relationship at the hospital was really good. The relationship there, and it's in my first book, they actually, when I started writing the book, I, um, I said, I can't really write this book without telling that story because you're such a big piece of it. And they said to me, not only is it okay, but we'll actually give you a quote for the book, which they did, because we are now teaching all of our incoming fundraisers, um, development people, frontline people, um, that story so it never happens again. So that was a really, really good result. And we, we continue to this day to be involved with them. And the research uh, uh, group that we funded, um, they were able to parlay our little bit of money into, uh, because that money is little bits when you're talking about big research institutions. Uh, and they were able to parlay that almost immediately into many, many more millions of dollars. And they now have a staff of 25 and they've been putting out all sorts of wonderful answers and research and stuff. So very proud of that, that's been great. Um, on the other side, um, the synagogue uh, was, you know, we, we did finish it, but I, I ended up leaving after a few years. It was um, not the right place for me, I think. And, uh, and I still have a lot of friends from there who uh, for a long time, they tried to get me to come back. And I just said, I just don't feel comfortable here. And so uh, they, they did, uh, and and they ended up. Um, I was I I did finish the board. I think I was another couple of years. I was on the board, um, but I I just found that there was not a meeting of, of the minds in terms of uh, growing the the organization. And I also learned a whole lot about boards, which is hopefully going to be a future book. So because I think right. that that can be done differently. So thanks. Yeah, in fact, you have you have uh, uh, information on boards in this book too, which is really really uh, amazing. Um, I. You know, one of the things that strikes me as you, you talk about this is that uh, one of the things we learn in fundraising, uh, for better or worse, is that if we have asked, uh, uh, first of all, we should always say thank you no matter what to everybody for everything. Um, but um, if we have asked for something and then um, people respond, then um, it, it's not only natural to say thank you, but then to explore um, you know, what that means, how it's going to be carried out and so forth, not just to remain silent. We have a question here from uh, someone in the chat saying, you know, if you were making a gift of stock, sometimes that kind of flummoxes people uh, or, or, or if, especially if it's stock that's going from private to public. So without getting into details of that particular yeah. relationship, yeah. was that a, a facet I'm of this? I'm, yeah, I'm very familiar with that issue. The money was already in a DAF. It was in a very well-known DAF in our, in our area and it had been there at, at that point you know, for a long time. Right. So, so that's, that's again, not a barrier. Um, you did well, mention, but, but you know what, but it doesn't help them feel better because they can't find out how much money is in my dad. So I don't think, uh, so I, I just think, I mean, by the way, they could have just asked and they didn't bother. And that's that I always think the answer to a lot of these questions is just ask. I mean, donors are not scary people. Uh, we're all right. donors in some way. And so just you're asking another person, it's another human, just ask. And I would have been more than happy to tell them. And if they said, I was, I were a little concerned here, we're very bureaucratic or whatever, could you please get us some, um, let us know, you know, what the name of the company is that's going public or how, the source of that. If they did it in a really nice, respectful way, I would have had no problem giving them any information they wanted, but no one ever asked. Right. Well, one, one of the other things that, that uh, hopefully we're taught to do is to ask both members of a couple so if it's a heterosexual couple like you and your husband and they had talked to you, they'd hopefully be talking to both of you since you had called and said, this is what I'd like to do. And they clearly didn't know what to do with this really wonderful news. Um, but the, the, the second part of that was a part that really struck me. Um, how much of that is attributable to, to gender, not just there, but across philanthropy? Well, thank you for that question. I did not, I, I kind of, believed for a very long time that gender was just not an issue. I've been a businesswoman for years. Yeah, I'd seen stuff. I was in the entertainment business uh, and all the things that you would expect there. But but it wasn't, I, it just didn't occur to me that that would exist in this world. And I have realized over time uh, that it absolutely has a lot to do with it. And uh, my favorite example of that, which you're probably familiar with, and I don't know if your listeners are, but um, is the um, uh, thing that happened at Dartmouth where they were raising their money. Are, are you familiar with that, Jay? No, okay. no, please. This is like the coolest thing. You could find this online. And I'm actually, 
I have a, I have a link to the person who started it, who I, I was trying yesterday. I'm going to try and sit down with her and make sure that all of my information and everything I got from the newspaper articles is accurate. But, but basically the story is, and I think this is indicative of what the landscape is right now for women. Um, and uh, especially, it, it, despite the fact that I think 60% of the world's wealth is actually now controlled by women. So uh, this woman at Dartmouth was a, uh, an alum. She was working at somewhere like Goldman Sachs. She was working at a big financial institution. She had graduated 20 years before and uh, her husband was not an alum, but all the fundraising for Dartmouth, all of the materials came to her husband as opposed to her. So she finally, after 20 years, decided that she'd had it. And instead of doing what maybe I would have done, which is say, forget you, Dartmouth, I'm going somewhere else. She decided to, to lean into it, if you will. And so she she went, she talked to the senior chancellor, whatever it was, and said, uh, we, I'd like to raise some money. And I'd, I'd like to put together a women's group and raise some money. And at this point, it didn't really say exactly how this happened, but I imagine her being patted on the head and sort of like, oh, sure, you go do that, honey. So she decides she's going to raise $100,000 from 10 different women and raise a million dollars. And the guy says, fine. It was a guy, I know that. And she said, uh, that's what I want to do. And he said, oh, yeah, okay, have a good time. And she did it instantly. I mean, almost instantly. Um, she then said, I'm going to raise a, a million dollars. I want a million dollars from a hundred different women. And I'm going to raise that. So not only did she raise the hundred million dollars, she actually let, she closed it, it, closed it. And then people were so wanting so badly to get into this that she had I think it was 103 women actually gave a million dollars each. But that has now been parlayed to $374 million as of today, I believe is the number, because they then did legacy gifts as well. And other people kind of joined in after the official you know, program was gone. And I just think that's the most wonderful thing that, that she did that, she proved it. I try to imagine the chancellor, whoever it was, apologizing to her. I don't know if that would be the case, but clearly that was a gender thing. Yeah, it, it seems like now, and that model is, you know, uh, I'm trying to remember the name of the organization where so many women are ra raising millions, but it's been uh, emulated by, uh, oh, I, I believe, uh, you know, United Way, American Heart, other organizations. And and it's, as, as you're saying, it's not the old, well, these are the spouses of kind of right. model of, of fundraising from years ago. This is This is women with agency resources commitment and their own vision. And it's a question of whether or not the organizations are going to open their doors to that. And this is both the men and the women, the organizations who have to open the door right. and make that possible. Um, so it, this is interesting that it's still going on in 2024. Uh, but uh, but you talk about that in the book, about age, gender, other factors. Um, well, I, well I, I, I just want to put in one quick thing. I do have this happen still, now that I'm more attuned to it. I'm not waiting for it, but I am attuned to it. Uh, I still have times, I would guess maybe every month or two, at least, somebody will say to me, we'd like to talk to you about giving. Uh, we'd like to sit down and have lunch with you or whatever it is or about our organization. And then they'll say, we'd like your husband to be there as well. And all I think of when they say that is, and my husband doesn't get involved in this. He's he's focused on creating wonderful things for the world. And, uh, and every time they do it, I think, would you have, I just want to, I haven't done it yet, but I want to say to them, would you have made, said that, what you just said, if I was a man? And I don't think they would. Yeah. Yeah. I, it's, it, it's, it's just, it's still stunning to me, but um, maybe it's just a matter of people experiencing it enough that they just change their behavior or they read about it and then they, hopefully they internalize it and change their behavior. Um, underlying all of this is something you talked about a minute ago and you say it right at the top of this book, which is my mission is simple to save giving. So this went from being about, you know, you and your experience, which is important enough. That was not just your money, that was your life. But it's also now, how do I make sure that this stops happening to people, that we start actually helping organizations to be better actors and do great things. Um, so when you, when you decided to take that on, what was the part of giving that you thought needed to be saved specifically? It wasn't just about fundraising practice, I guess, was it? It was more than that. Well, yeah, it's kind of all of it. It's this okay. idea of, um, and, and I, I, if I can distill it down, I'll, I'll try and distill it down to one or two points. Uh, one of them is the idea that I said earlier that that to understand and recognize that donors are people, uh, just like you and I. And when you have a question for a donor, uh, you want to know something about them, you should ask, and you should you should have a relationship with them as opposed to this transactional. Let me get as much money 
I, I actually did see something, I think it was this morning, um, something came through about, you know, new tricks to use. And whenever I see that word tricks, it really freaks me out. And uh, it's, it's, and I had someone a few weeks ago come up to me and they said, I listen to you, I read your books, but my boss said, we don't have time to create relationships, just go get the money. And that's still happening on a regular basis. And that's a real problem. And I know, and I'm sure most everyone on this uh, webinar knows that, that uh, you know, four out of every five first time donors will go away between year one and year two. And so we have to replenish those four donors every single year. And then we have to try and get more because costs go up and things follow that. And it's this crazy treadmill. And so when people feel like they're on a treadmill, uh, they are on a treadmill. And, and the only way off of that is to start realizing that the donors can be partners, that, that the don donors are there because there's something about it. They get out of this, not something, I, I, whatever, whatever, you know, it is I, not a trophy or whatever it is. They, they feel good about it. I mean, every bit, bit of research shows that people who give uh, philanthropically actually live longer. They actually do better. They're happier people. So let me be a happier person and take my money, you know, and it's, it's, but, but the reticence to change, I think it's kind of top to bottom has to change. And I think it will, uh, because this can't continue. It just can't continue. And we'll keep thinking of excuses of why are the numbers down? Why are the numbers not up? Why are they? And the answer is pretty much the same, which is you're doing this the same way you've been doing it for a hundred years and it doesn't make sense anymore. Um, one of my favorite examples of this is I found out because I do this full time now and I work with uh, lots of different organizations uh, is that um, uh, fundraisers are told in I don't know, not the fundraising school, but in some sort of fundraising school or whatever, that they're not to talk. This is a, a general thing I've been told. They're told not to talk about yourself. And I understand that someone along the way must have said, yeah, but they don't want to know what you had for lunch today. But but this is a standard piece of, you know, the whatever, a few days of training or whatever it is you get is do not talk about yourself. And I, as a donor, know that if the person's not going to talk about themselves, I won't believe anything they say. I'm not going to think they're authentic. I'm not going to want to continue the conversation. I'm going to be probably suspicious. And most importantly, I want to know why they're passionate about this organization. And if they're not, and so usually I start this now to try and get it, people used to it. And I'll say, why did you decide to do this? Why, why did you decide to get involved in such a difficult uh, sector and have such a difficult job? And um, it, 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 it's, it's, it, 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 you must have some other reason. And, and I hope that they will then say, well, because I love the mission, right? But if they don't say that, and I have had people where it's very clear, oh, well, I've been going around every 16 months from one place to another, that they really are re just doing it for the quick fix. They're not doing it because they have a passion. If they have a passion for, if, and most people do, they have a passion for the mission and they're a fundraiser. The fun part is, one of the fun parts of this is that if they communicate that to the donor, most of the time the donor will then say, they're gonna say, oh, I did this, it's hard, really hard, but I love it because of blah, blah, blah. The donor will say, oh my gosh, how can I help? And then you don't even have to worry about what about my ask, because we're going to ask because we want to be part of that. I mean, a normal human wants to be part of that. And we can't, we don't seem to be able to get there, but hopefully we will, will soon. You, you know, you, when you talked about the Chronicle before, it, it made me think of that because if they are, and they work really hard as journalists to gather stories for our sector. Yeah. But as you said, at least when they talk to you, they weren't reaching out to or able to reach donors and you were an exception um i wonder why that is that that uh there's a disconnect and why people aren't talking to each other do, do you think that uh, that donors because you've now talked to a lot of other people who have been in your shoes living through this experience do you think the donors are reluctant to take those calls in the first place or do you yeah. think that the journalists and the fundraisers just aren't bothering to call i think it's a little bit of both but uh it's more likely that the journalists and fundraisers are asking or calling at some point. Uh, I have, I asked before I wrote the book, I asked a bunch of donors, why don't you talk? I've, I've noticed this thing. I'm worried about the sector. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I was treated strangely. Why don't you say anything? And the answer I got over and over again is, well, we'll just hang up the phone if they're talking to us that way. And we don't want to give money. We just, we'll just nix them off our list or we'll just leave the meeting and never talk to them again. Because we're the people that have something that they're looking for and we just don't want to have any, like it's basically the way I interpret it is I don't want to waste my breath. And I think that's really sad, but they do feel like, yeah, I don't want to take this whole thing on. And 
I think that donors should be surveyed on a regular basis uh, and about some of their hopes and wants and needs and not by the financial institutions who are totally onto this because they want you to keep your money in their institution. So they talk all about this. We want to hear what you want and what you need and how you feel. But your, your rank and file fundraiser doesn't really do that. And I think the reason for that is because they've been taught not to talk about themselves. They've been taught to um, pander to donors. The donors are this, this monolithic thing that if you just push the right button, the money will start falling from the money tree. And that's offensive and obviously untrue. Um, we did have a comment in the chat where uh, someone had said, it falls on deaf ears if we try to say something. And I think the uh, we in this case are donors like yourself. And, and, and and like myself, I mean, I, what I hope is also true is that we are donors to the causes which matter to us. And if we are working within an organization on the staff level, I hope that we believe enough in it that we're also supporting it at some level. So that, then that testimony we make really comes from a place of authenticity. Uh, back to your point. But if if uh, if this comment is, is universal, it is very strange uh, that uh, if people make a comment and it falls on deaf ears, then how in the world can the organization change? So now that you've been kind of preaching from this, uh, this, this story for a bit now, are you seeing some of the organizations kind of change? Or is there some kind of epiphany? Or I don't even know what the right word is. That sounds religious. But are they coming up to you and saying, you know, this is my V8 moment. I, I can't believe that I haven't been listening to this before. I love the V8 reference. That was awesome. Thank you, Jake. Uh, yes, it, 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 I am noticing change. I, I, I can just tell you that I am noticing change. I get calls all the time, not every minute, but I would say at least a few a week where somebody says, you know what, we're using, and it's usually new people. It's somebody's, hi, I'm new to this university. I'm new to this, whatever. And they're in a leadership role. And they say, you know what, I, I was introduced to your book. I've been a donor and a fundraiser in the past. I think this is the way to do it. And we're then going to share that book with the rest of our staff. And that's the way we're going to do things. And we would love your help. And I just get so excited when that happens. Or if I put something in one of my weekly, um, uh, I, I do a weekly tip of the week. And then I also do a newsletter every two weeks. And I'll talk about some different subject in this whole landscape. Uh, and all of a sudden, I'll see other uh, publications start to talk about that issue. Like, okay, well, it's happening. That's good. So, you know, I could say, wait a minute, that was my idea. But instead, I'm saying, okay, it's getting through. It's starting to get through little by little. And uh, I I'm also constantly trying to think of ways to help fundraisers to get that message through to their superiors and the people that they work with. Uh, and and I have some ideas uh, and, and some have been implemented. Some of them I'm still working on. I think a lot of that is to, because I'm guessing a lot of people on uh, uh, on the, in the session are um, wondering like how do we how do we do that we we don't have that kind of agency at our organization to be able to make that change I think you become the nice person who shows them some numbers and right now that stuff's quantified in numbers and so if you could figure out a way of making it or somebody can figure out a way of making uh, you know charts with colors and whatever showing that it is not sustainable to have four out of every five donors disappear. It is not sustainable to have fundraisers stay for 16 months and then you retrain them. That's a bad use of donors' money. Uh, and so those are all issues that are about them and their world and the fundraising world. And, uh, and the other piece that works is comparing our statistics to statistics in other sectors. Uh, so nobody has a churn rate as close as ours, uh, it, not even in the same ballpark. Uh, and, and we need you get to a certain point where you hope that somebody along the way is going to say, huh, this does make sense. We do need to find a different path. And I'm hoping that happens more all the time. Yeah. I, I mean, it just strikes me that, like you said, if, if you're in any kind of um, business where you're selling a product, if you're falling below 80% retention, it's a disaster. That's right. um, uh, but um, I'm curious about whether or not, as you've been exploring these ideas, you're getting some positive reactions. Organizations are starting to to discuss this, they're, they're marrying some of the data that we get from the fundraising effectiveness project that talks about retention rates. So important to have that data, be able to color code it and put it in a graph and talk about it. But maybe they didn't really have a prescription. Now they they do, it's more clear. You know, you've made it very clear here. Um, but are you also getting blowback either from other donors or from organizations or the kind of the, you know, the pundits in philanthropy, uh, people say, ah, yeah. oh, no, this is just another donor saying whatever. I mean, are you, what kind of I, feedback do you get? 
I actually, the only blowback, if you will, which is minuscule, is people saying, and, and we already disproved this in the, uh, in the chat today, people will say, oh, that's just you. Or you must have only been talking about little organizations that you give to, which clearly I'm not. Or you're only talking about big organizations that have a bureaucratic structure. I get that sometimes, not very often, um, because it gets disproved. If it's in a group setting, somebody always says, yeah, this happened to me too. So uh, yeah, it's it's as far as any other kind of um, blowback, like, I mean, some people I think just say, you know, we can't believe you're spending all this time doing this when you could go out and be shopping or traveling or something. But, um, but I, I really don't get much of it. However, I have to think, because I am an optimistic person, but I do think, well, if somebody really felt like they don't believe in relationships. A, they probably wouldn't talk about it to anybody, but I certainly wouldn't see them because they wouldn't come to one of my events. And um, I, I almost never get emails saying, I, I think probably the most unpleasant email I ever got was something like, well, that's just you, um, that kind of thing. And nothing else, nothing nothing substantive. I haven't heard anything else like that. Uh, yeah, that's that, that's that's great. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Uh, one of the things you were mentioning right there is about communication. I guess all of this is really at some level about communication. And part of that has to do with the words we use and, and whether or not they make sense to us. And you you talked about that earlier with like yeah. hearing capital campaign from CCS and then, oh yeah, that's what we're doing here. And But that's the term that CCS and people inside the fundraising world use. Um, it, there's a lot of that, I have a feeling. And a you lot. have a whole glossary at the back. I know I'm starting from the back and working <laughs> at the front, but there's a glossary. I love definitions especially when it's not just that people don't necessarily, one group of people doesn't know what another group is saying, but maybe when they understand those words differently. Do you mind giving us just a couple highlights that you think are particularly sure. important here? Yeah, I have a bunch of them. Uh, so one is, uh, gosh, I have to just choose one. Okay, the the and these usually give pause to whoever in fundraising gets them because they always thought the other person knew. I had someone recently say to me, well, don't you know what the donor pyramid is? And I said, why in the world would I know what the donor pyramid is? <laughs> I, that was just crazy. Um, I have a, a, another one is when you say planned giving versus legacy giving. Planned giving to me, if it was five years ago, means I'm planning to give you a gift. Why Why wouldn't you call it? I mean, legacy giving, okay, I get that. But planned giving? like, And I remember actually saying to people, do you mean now or later? Or like, I, I don't understand. So, which is crazy. When somebody says, um, these are lapsed, donors. I'm like, well, I don't understand laps. You probably saw this in the back. You know, is this like I'm a lapsed Catholic or something? Like, what did I do wrong? And I find that what they think I did wrong is I didn't give every year, but I didn't know when I gave you one gift that I'm signing up for a subscription. I didn't know that I was expected to give the next year. So when somebody comes back and says to me, we'd like you to increase your gift this year, I don't even know what to say because I never told them I was going to give a gift following year. We never talked about it. So why are they assuming that and assuming I would give more money on top of it? So it took me a very long time, probably till the last year, where I realized that that fundraisers are told that and feel like it is a failure if the person who gave a previous year doesn't give more the next year. And I, I have now been able to see it. I've, I've sat across the table in person with fundraisers and I can watch their face fall when I say, I'd like to give you the same amount. And that really sucks, I just wanna say. Uh, so there's, but there's a, a lot of language there that we just don't know. One of my, my favorite, favorite stories, another thing I just found out in the last year uh, is, uh, it, well, <laughs> um, there's, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, Oh gosh, there's a lot of different things that happen where I think this is the norm. And, um, and, and or I think what I think should be the norm is the norm. And it's not always, um, and it's not always the norm. So here's what happened. I've had a couple instances, one in particular, where I gave to an organization, and I gave them about $1,000 a year. I give to the organization a couple of times. I don't give them more because I didn't know I was supposed to, but whatever. And then one year I decide to give them $5,000. And I've developed a relationship with the person, let's call her Cindy. And I, I, over those years, and I all of a sudden get this email saying, oh, we want to let you know that uh, Cindy will no longer be, um, isn't work, won't be working with you anymore. So-and-so will be working with you. And I thought, oh my God, Cindy left. Where did she go? So I called and I said, where did Cindy go? And they said, Cindy's still working here. And I said, what do you mean Cindy's still working here? And they said, well, she's never left. She's still working here. 
And then I thought, oh my gosh, I must have said something to offend Cindy. Why did they, why did they, they switch this person? Like, what could I possibly have said? It wasn't until a year ago, and I sat with that. It wasn't until a year ago that I realized that that with the donor pyramid stuff, right? You, I moved to the five thousand dollar category, so I had a new person, and the organization really didn't care that I had a relationship with Cindy. And there's so many ways they could have saved that. They could have had the the senior person come with Cindy. They could have told me honestly what was happening, whatever. But they didn't. They just didn't told Cindy she can't be with me anymore, and that is a horrible feeling. And I think a practice that needs to stop. I, I love that example because uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but one is that it doesn't sound to me like you're saying that Cindy was your fast friend. It's just, it's a relationship, a professional relationship that had developed and that was one of trust. And when they severed that for their own internal kind of weird, you know, sales metrics, it must've felt unnerving. And as you said, did you do something? If, if, a, if a person is contributing to an organization, supporting it feels they've done something wrong because our internal process is so arcane, that's really alarming. And that must be happening every day to so many people. It absolutely is. And here's where I get really concerned about the sector, another place where I do, which is if somebody, there's all these young people coming in, there's over mm -hmm. a million uh, millionaires in the US under 30 years old right now, okay? And, and I tell people this all the time and say, you need to put one on your board or two. And they say to me, but they don't have any money. And I said, we started this conversation with me saying there's a million out there. So why are we having, like, are you not listening to me? Maybe that's a gender thing again. I, I don't know. But there, yeah, there, 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 there has to be a recognition that there are a lot of people out there who have never done this before. And my big concern is that they will try this once. They will have one of those conversations and then they will put all their money in the bank and leave it to their cat because they just don't want to deal. And that's what I'm really worried about is that we're going to have like a generation of young people who want to give, who will get older. And they're just going to say, oh, I tried that once. It really sucked. So yeah. that's what I'm concerned about. Although we'll have a lot of rich cats. So maybe there's that benefit. <laughs> there you go. Uh, but uh, it, well, in fact, that is something you talk about later in that little board section where you talk about um, board composition and uh, age. And this is something that's always driven me crazy. I think you focus on millennials, but we definitely see it with Gen Z too, right? I mean, there are a lot of people in that yeah. generation also who are pouring their hearts into causes, but they aren't always ones that have a 501c3 label. And, um, but that doesn't mean they wouldn't. Maybe it just means the organizations haven't reached out to them because they haven't fit their criteria of what constitutes a donor yet, and certainly okay. not to serve on a board. So, but I don't want to be speaking for you. So if you have a kind of a general observation about age and when it comes to leadership and donors, what, what would your, what would your advice be to, to our, our, our sector? Okay. Well, one's going to be very, very specific because we now know from a lot of research that Gen Z uh, and, um, I would say you know, Gen Z people, um, millennials, et cetera, but mostly, mostly the youngest of the younger. So, right, they are actually volunteering for organizations because they read, they're smart, not they, not everybody, but a lot of them are. And they have a sense that they, they're a little bit mistrusting of, of entity, you know, especially institutional entities. So they're volunteering for those organizations and they're not telling anyone that they have money. They just don't, they just volunteer. And then they're gonna get a sense of the kind of vibe of the organization and this dysfunction, functionality or dysfunctionality of that organization. And they won't tell somebody that they're a donor until, until they feel confident that this is a place they wanna be part of. The interesting thing is that most nonprofits segregate and silo their volunteers separate from their donors. So that we have to fix that because I have had situations, oh no, they're a volunteer. Oh no, they're a recurring, they're a monthly donor. They only give a little bit. We don't really have, they're on a different list. We don't treat them the same way. And we're making a big giant mistake there. Yeah, you talked about that with volunteers in the book too. And there are a lot of, this is a little bit of a generalization, but there, there's this, probably this perception that you have a lot of volunteers who are quite young, maybe if they participate at all. And then older, like retired, but actually yeah. there's a lot of opportunities for volunteers and we aren't always looking at all those opportunities, especially when it comes to people who are already spending their time with us. We're not necessarily inviting them to also invest with us. Right. Because we, we, we have this preconceived notion that they can't possibly be investors if they're volunteering. And, uh, you know, Gen Z is completely turning that around and saying, you know, watch us. Um, but, but you won't get to the money part if you treat them poorly as a volunteer. And so when people come to me and they say, look, I've been through my 
my, um, uh, you know, whatever, 150 a day people or whatever it is, and I've been through my file and I've done my blah, blah, blah then, you know, I, I need to find some new donors and I'll just say to them, do you have volunteers? Oh yeah, we have, you know, whatever, a thousand of them, but you know, volunteers. I, no, why don't you go to those volunteers? Because if you have a thousand volunteers, I will bet you any amount of money that there is money in that group of, of volunteers. And my proof of that, I actually have proof of that, which is, it's, it's a little bit anecdotal, but everybody has had this experience, is with bequests. When you get bequests, every organization I know of that's gotten multiple bequests, there's always one where somebody says, who is this person? We don't know them. They're not on our regular list. I'm told this could be as much as 50% of the time. And what do you find out about that person when someone's told to go research who is this person who just gave us money? Well, obviously they're deceased, but you know who, who were they? And you find out, oh, that's somebody who was volunteering or that's somebody who, you know, came to something a few years ago and it changed their life. That's, and I don't mean a gala, you know, something. So they, they weren't on the list. And, and I've never talked to a fundraiser who's been doing this for a while, who's never had that experience. So we know that those are people that, you know, and we've all heard, and we've all heard stories. You've seen things in the paper about, you know, the mail carrier who all of a sudden had all this money and then, and then they left it to XYZ organization. So if we know that to be true, not all the time, but a lot of the time, then why do we keep treating the volunteers like they're second rate citizens? Nobody should be treated as a second rate citizen. Right. There's an opportunity for people to be involved however they can. Um, if we just have the doors open to them. But I guess then that, again, requires some actual active communication, asking people questions, whether that's a survey or a one-to-one. -one. Um, maybe the next time there's an event, actually asking people how they can be involved with the organization. There are a hundred right. different ways we can just have a normal human conversation. Um, but for some reason, that that uh, there seems to be an interruption there. And maybe it's not just language. Maybe it's also um, how we assume things about people. And you talk about that in the book and you i don't know if you're quoting it intentionally or if it's just something that appears in a lot of places but i always think of the odd couple when i hear that yeah is that what you were, <laughs> when you yeah. assume you make an ass out of you, and, you me. and me yes, yes absolutely i didn't realize i came from the odd couple actually i just knew that I, was a thing so thank I, you i don't i don't know if it was the odd couple they used it though as well but yeah. um but this thing about assumptions that people have you know it's um, awful. fundraisers assuming things about donors donors probably making some assumptions about nonprofits. Uh, how do we break that down a little bit? What what do we do to break well, down that? Yeah, so one thing that I do is when I go to events and public events and all, I try to dress down as much as possible. I mean, I'm not wearing shorts and a t-shirt, but I want people to see this is a donor. This is a, this is th this person has given millions of dollars and they are a donor. So stop, you know, so get over yourself. Donors are not these scary people. Are there people in the news who have like a bad actor? Sure. But but most donors are just normal people and you need to kind of stop thinking it's about, you know, the, the oh, well, they're wealthy. They must do X, Y, and Z. You know, like, like you said, they assume all that. Someone said this to me really well the other day and, and I, I don't think it was you, but it was uh, stop answering questions for people before you ask, before you ask the question. So don't, don't say, I already have the answer. I don't even need to ask the question because you don't, you might not have that answer. And, uh, but this assumption about, people with money being anything. I mean, that's, they might as well assume that every fundraiser is this way then, or every somebody, there is no every everything and people are all the same, uh, which is why we, it is critical that we take the time to actually talk to people as human beings. And you will find out how these people are different and what their, what their needs and what they're, what, what they want. And, um, and, and I don't mean what they want, like to change your mission. I mean, what do they want in life? They want to feel good about doing something. They want to feel like they've contributed. So why do we have reticence about sending uh, impact reports to people other than in an annual report once a year? Most people, we've done lots of surveys, most people don't want an annual report. And in fact, I as a donor get really pissed off that I spend, I, I, I've been in graphic design stuff in the past. I know how much it costs to make those. And I look at it and say, why are you doing this? Who actually is reading it? Put, give it, do a digital version, print on demand, do something like that. But you know what? send me, just send me a, t a text that says, hey, this amazing thing just happened today. I'm going to love that. And, you know, when they say you can't, you can't ask people for money over Zoom, which I know a lot of organizations still say right now, lots and lots of them. Why not? Why can't you just ask me? I'm just a person. You can have meetings over Zoom. You're comfortable with that. So if the person says, you say to them, how would you like to, to have a, dis I have a discussion about you 
and I think you should use these words, financially supporting our organization. Not just, I want to hear from you some information. I'm not going to ask you for money and then ask me for money. Don't do that. But but say, oh, you know what, I'd like to talk to you about, learn more about you and tell you about our organization. See if you're interested in any kind of financial financial support. And then I know going in what's going to be happening and it's all very clear and you're treating me as another human and you would want the same for yourself. So I think if we just mm-hmm. use those rules, a lot of the stuff that I give, they're specific, but they're also all based on it. how would you like to be treated? Right. <laughs> you know, it just strikes me that, it, that the, the idea that somehow um, financial circumstances somehow make a person a different species, you know, whether that's because they have less or they have more is kind of bizarre. It, 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 it is kind of bizarre. So it's great that you're working to kind of defeat that. I mean, if one out of two of us is a donor, then that means most of us know what it's like to be a donor and maybe we can just treat each other like we'd want ourselves to be treated maybe a little bit better well right so when we get into this weird conversation people are having about don't say thank you to donors because there's a power imbalance and they don't they don't deserve it like what i'm sorry when you're 18 months old you learn how to say thank you and every parent tells their kid how to say thank you so this is just manners like what why does this have to be taken to some other level just say thank you and they'll say thank you to you for helping them make it happen and giving them information on how you're doing so it's these little basic things that just come up and 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 you're right it doesn't matter if it's more or less money you don't change as a person i've been monopolizing this conversation with you and i want to make sure that since there are people with us live here um, and i'm sure the people watching the recording will enjoy this as well if you have questions this is your chance this is yeah. your chance actually to ask a question of someone who's made these kinds of financial commitments and is willing to talk about it. So if you have a question about any of this, please put it in the chat or the Q&A right now. This is really a great opportunity to have this conversation and, and open it up. And as we're doing that, uh, Lisa, do, you mentioned that you have um, a newsletter and some things that you shoot out on a regular yeah. basis that, that I know follow some of these lessons. Can you share how people can learn about that? And Jack can put that in the chat. Yeah, just go to Lisa, um, lisagreer.com, just my name, L-I-S-A-G-R-E-E-R.com. And on my website, it will give you hundreds, if not many hundreds of of tips that I've had in the past. You can sign up for the tip of the day. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can sign up for a a small group session, live session I have with my paid subscribers every month uh, where people come and talk about their issues at their nonprofits. And we have a group that kind of gets together, sort of like a mini mastermind. Uh, And uh, and and also learn how to get my books and all that kind of stuff. So just lisagreer.com, pretty simple. Oh, we, we got new have, messages. Yay. Yes, we have a question right here. If you want to tackle that. Sure. Um, so let's see. Uh, oh, I like Jack chiming in. Hey, Jack. <laughs> uh, so uh, yes, the new development officer thing we talked about. Um, let's see. Thanks, Jay. Uh, oh, how do I find new donors who will support new projects? Uh, I think you just this is back to the sharing my passion. You share with them your passion about the project. This is really exciting. We're not, and I I have to tell you as a donor, you get skeptical as you go along and I'll think, oh, you're just telling me about a new project to get more money from me, which you might be, but but if it really is for a new project and there's a logical reason why you're adding on this project, I want you to tell me about that. And if it's not me, I might have friends who I want to turn on to this and think that might be up their alley. You have absolutely nothing to lose by telling a donor about a new project. And let me see, I know we had one comment down here. Uh, oh, there we go from Matt who had said, what's the best way to approach donors with innovative ways to support and increase the impact of their favorite causes? Uh, okay, uh, I think you talk to them. <laughs> you you know, you talk to them about ideas. Here's some ways you can you, you can help with this. And uh, one, of, one of my favorite ways to do this, and this will immediately increase trust um, and, and the feeling of authenticity is, talk to the donor about other organizations um, because it then the minute you do that, people start thinking, oh, you really are here to have an honest conversation with me. You're not completely just, I'll say whatever I want, I have to say to get money from you. And so I will, I can, I, I can breathe better after somebody says that. I had one donor, one fundraiser who emailed me, uh, was it was like early in COVID and he said, um, I was trying to help him with his fundraising. And he said, um, I think I did something really bad and I just want to run it by you. And he said, I found this person and they said, look, I'm just not into that. Um, and, and, but, uh, I'm, and I'm having a really hard time because of what ABC, D, and e, whatever. And he said, oh, I know somebody who helps people with that situation. Can I introduce them? 
And all of a sudden, this relationship builds. So now I have some people who say, oh my God, my boss would be so mad if I suggested another organization. And I am myself was told that I actually, and this just drives me, drives me crazy, a very large organization here in LA, uh, I talked to some people with inside and, and I'd give, given to them in the past, I don't anymore. And they were told to look and see what organizations I gave to in addition to them to find out what those organizations did and then say that they're creating a new project that does what that organization does so that I will give them money. <laughs> oh, wow. Really? Yeah. And that, that stuff happens. So that's just terrible. So that's the oh, difference wow. between long-term thinking and short-term thinking, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, well, I'm a big advocate for understanding donors and knowing what they support, but that's not so we can twist it around and invent some way to extract yep. money from people like their, you know, mineral mines. That's horrible. Yeah. Um, I, 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 yeah, I know we have another couple here. Um, let me see any thoughts about totally asking right. for gifts, to the annual fund, uh, that are, yeah. when there are sexier projects, this comes up a lot, actually, I'm sure you run into this because yeah. I'm sure you've supported organizations for operating support as well as for capital. So what are your thoughts yeah. on that? Oh, and you bring up a really good piece. Uh, the operating support thing, Donors are not, not all donors again, but most donors are not idiots. They've, they've gotten to where they are because they have some amount of financial acumen. They know that in order to have good people, they have to get paid. <laughs> I mean, they just, so this idea that there was a statistic that said that 83% of donors uh, of um, fundraisers are a little bit or are, are somewhat or very uncomfortable asking for money for operational costs. And, um, and so the fundraisers aren't asking. The donors are saying, well, of course you have to get paid. And by the way, I don't want to sit across the table from a fundraiser who clearly isn't into this because you couldn't afford to get the one who was into it. I'd rather give you more money. Like, tell me what I can do to increase the quality, uh, uh, up the quality, or what, what do they call it? Level up the quality of the people on uh, here. Tell me what your issues are. Don't shy away from them. We're not dumb. So I realize that there are some organizations and some foundations, et cetera, that have said, we don't want it to go there. But but most donors, if they're sitting down with you, most of them really want to know where do you need help and let's figure it out together. Yeah. Um, I know that we are coming to the hour and I barely scratched the surface of this book and that's not because I want people to buy it, but I do. So um, <laughs> there's a lot in here and you really do break down all the different parts of much of fundraising, but you do it in a way that I think we can discuss with our board members and with new incoming staff um, and others. So I would really encourage people to take a look at this at a minimum, maybe use it as a, as a way of discussing these issues with your friends and colleagues. Um, and, uh, and I would encourage you also to follow uh, Lisa's work because you can tell that she is not done. <laughs> She's just getting. I, I am not started. done. And one quick thing is the book is also available in audiobook. Uh, we've got a wonderful narrator who also narrated the first book and, uh, and as an ebook. So if that makes it easier for you. Perfect. Thank you so much for all this, Lisa. Really appreciate it. Um, really, always wonderful to talk with you. Thank you. And thanks, Jack. Take care. Bye. And thank you to everybody who's been with us live. Thank you to those who are uh, enjoying this afterwards. It's something you can share. Uh, I hope you will. And if you are looking forward to a copy of this, you'll find that if you attended with us live, or even if you registered and couldn't, um, then there will be a link coming to you through an email. So be on the lookout for that. And if you don't see it, just go to your spam folder. Or if you want to know anything more about this series or what's coming up next, including our session on AI, which I should have asked Lisa about. But anyway, we have a big session on uh, ethical uses of AI with Nathan Chappelle that's coming up on Monday. You do not want to miss that. He'll be summarizing much of what just came through the fundraising AI conference. So all of that's on Monday. So until then, take care, everybody. Thank you, Lisa.